I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist at Kent State University in Ohio. Uh, I mostly work on what are called zoonotic diseases. So those are or, uh, diseases that are transmitted between animals and people. And earlier this week, I wrote a column for Quantum Magazine about how our existing knowledge of coronaviruses can potentially help us inform um, knowing under, and understanding what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm here today on uh, the Quantum Magazine YouTube channel to answer some additional questions that have come in on social media um, in the comments of that article and, um, and elsewhere. And there is a function where you can also ask questions during the talk and those will be relayed to me. So I guess I'll answer as many of those as possible. Um, and I will get started with a few that already came in um, from various locations already. So one question, uh, does immunity conferred from infection by a cold coronavirus? So there are four um, other types of coronaviruses that cause kind of the common cold um, in humans that have been identified um, previously. So does immunity to these provide um, prophylaxis or I guess immunity to COVID-19? Um, and is anyone asking asymptomatic or immune cases about recent cold infections? Um, and the answer is, I mean, we're not 100% sure, but probably not. There doesn't seem to be a lot of, um, of cross-protective immunity between the various coronavirus species. And even when immunity develops, it seems to wane relatively quickly. So that's um, looking at both patients who had had SARS uh, kind of the original SARS from 2002 and 2003, and following those over time, at least the antibody response seemed to drop off pretty dramatically over a period of about one to three years. Um, looking at some of the other human coronaviruses, the common cold coronaviruses, that immunity also seems to wane relatively quickly. So, um, so uh, you would have to have had a cold relatively recently, which is one of the things that they asked. There are people asking, or, um, if they've had colds. Um, and I don't know any studies that are doing that currently, but you would have to do more than just ask about colds. What you would really want to do is to set up a study to um, sample people over time and not only ask about colds, because those can be caused um, only about uh, the common cold, about 20% of those are caused by coronaviruses. So the other 80% or so are other types of viruses that would not be protective. Um, so what you want to do is really sample over time and look at people who are getting those common cold viruses and then look at if they are able to be infected with um, SARS coronavirus 2. A problem with doing that right now, of course, is that uh, our testing supplies are very limited. Um, even, even things like you know, PPE, um, personal protective equipment for people who are doing the sampling, the swabs that we use to do the sampling are also in short supply. Um, so that type of study would be difficult to do right now um, to get any kind of definitive answers, but I guarantee people are probably looking at those types of things in other animal models um, and other aspects as well. So that is definitely something that's on people's minds. And one thing I wanted to add with that was um, that's also kind of one hypothesis that's been put forward regarding why kids may uh, not be as seriously infected with this, um, may not have, have symptoms that are as serious as adults get is that you know kids are, are germy and uh, may have more colds from coronaviruses more recently than adults have. So that's another thing that's being investigated. Um, although I don't know, you know, I, I know it's been been bounced around the research community. So I know it's on people's minds. Um, all right, some other ones, let's see. Um, all right, uh, in the realm of neurological changes and the search for characteristic symptoms, um, which might be easier to detect, to detect than loss of taste and smell, has anyone thought to look for changes in hearing, maybe loss of upper octaves? Um, and I don't know about that. Uh, that's really interesting, but I don't know that that would necessarily be easier to detect um, because you do have to have equipment to do that. And it, it also helps to have like a before and after to know if, um, if before coronavirus infection, people were able to detect those upper, upper octaves anyway, because of course that's something that um, many adults lose over time, um, just from you know, being around loud noises and going to concerts and things like that. 
Um, I have not seen any evidence that the virus affects um, nerves of the auditory system. Um, with the olfactory system, we do know that um, this virus and, and other coronaviruses as well can enter um, through olfactory nerves and um, can affect some of the tissue around those and, and may um, cause kind of pathology in, in that manner. And that may be what causes um, loss of, of sense and taste, but we're not even sure of that yet. Um, so I think there's a, a whole lot of open questions around those neurological issues um, with, with, with SARS coronavirus too that are still really big unknowns. And I haven't seen anything regarding um, hearing for that. All right, um, Twitter. So um, I have a question. If the coronavirus family has a low rate of mutations, why has it been so difficult to make a vaccine? Um, and this is from Becca O. Uh, the motifs and structures in them are relatively conserved, and why are they not um, very immunogenic? And so for, for vaccines, there are a whole lot of things that really need to come together to create a, an effective and safe vaccine. And so um, one of them is the mutation rate. Obviously, if something mutates really quickly, like influenza, it makes it more difficult to create a vaccine because um, it mutates around that, and so you have to update it frequently. But that's not the only issue. So you have to find you know, good antigens, ones that um, will, will generate a robust immune response and ones that will not you know, harm the host. So that's been kind of the challenge with this. And so we do have a good target antigen in the spike protein. Um, so this is the one that is used to by the virus to attach to host cells. And so there was a lot of work on this in, in kind of the SARS era. So when, uh, that virus was recognized and its kind of pathogenic properties were, were realized and, and we saw how harmful this could be, there was a big infusion in funding for vaccines for, um, for SARS coronavirus. And so there were a lot of groups working on it and a lot of them had some candidate vaccines that ended up getting tested, um, some in animal models. But then, you know, SARS went away. Um, we were able to contain it. And with, with the other serious human coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, it really hasn't um, created the kinds of epidemics that, that SARS did. So there was just kind of that, a loss of interest in coronavirus vaccines for you know maybe like 2008 till basically the present. Um, so a lot of, of, of things got developed and then never followed up on. So that's one big problem is, is that they just never got um, into you know, robust human tests for safety and efficacy. Um, we were just never able to do those with the previous candidates. So they're there. Um, but one of the other problems potentially was that when they used the whole protein, so the entire protein, they did find that in some cases, it seemed to cause more harm to some of the vaccinated animals than protection. And so this was through a mechanism called antibody dependent enhancement. We see this with some other viral diseases, most notably dengue virus, um, where if you're infected once and then infected again with a different strain of dengue, you're actually more likely to have um, severe outcomes to get dengue hemorrhagic fever than, um, than those who had only been infected once. So, those antibodies don't necessarily protect you. They can actually enhance the ability of the virus to um, potentially enter host cells and, and um, a number of other things that lead to a more severe outcome the second time you're infected. And so they saw that with some of these candidate vaccines. And so um, instead of using the whole spike protein, they have kind of um, chopped it up to look at the smallest piece that is both um, you know, effective as an in, um, antigen but doesn't cause this kind of antibody dependent enhancement. So um, that's what they're doing for most of the candidate vaccines is, is some pieces or parts of the, the spike protein. And I would, will say that there are about a hundred different uh, vaccine candidates that are in some form of development right now. So there's a lot of them out there. Um, so it, it, it's really been just that we, we kind of lost a lot of that work um, in the last decade or so. And now we're trying to play catch up in you know, a period of, of three months or so. Um, so it, it's, it's not that necessarily we don't know that we you know, 
that is super difficult to make or that we can't make one or that we really failed in the past. It's just that we kind of stopped in the past because we didn't have much reason to, um, to go on. So I think there's a lot of hope that we will be able to create a vaccine for this, but um, we're, it's just kind of overcoming some of those challenges where we left off previously. And now you have to pick up those research programs um, almost from scratch. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, so this is from YouTube. Um, so can't social distancing only work if we um, keep that going until we get a vaccine? I'm assuming we stop social distancing before a vaccine, aren't we just going to get a second wave until we hit herd immunity and therefore social distancing didn't actually do anything? So that's one of the things that we're uh, working out right now. Um, so what we've done so far, there is evidence that social distancing in the United States and, and elsewhere um, has worked pretty well, that we have slowed down the spread of this. Um, it's estimated that across the United States, the um, basic reproductive number right now, um, averaging again everything, um, is, is right about at one. So that means that on average, each person who is infected spreads it to one other person. So this is better than what it was initially in the outbreak, which is estimated to be um, around three. And this is because most people are, are doing this, this social distancing. Most, uh, most areas have implemented that. But a couple things, that means one, it's still spreading. Um, even if the reproductive number is lower, um, it still is not extinguished because on average, still each person is spreading it to at least one other person, which means it will continue to, to spread even if it's slower than it would have spread um, uh, you know, in March. Um, and um, sorry, my dogs are running outside and distracting me. Um, and, and so, so that means it, it, it is still spreading. And then of course, some states are reopening. So Georgia, Texas, others, are loosening some of their restrictions on some of these social gatherings and opening up, um, you know, hair salons and tattoo parlors and and restaurants in some cases. So you do have that potential for additional cases from that, right? So, as as um, public health experts, what we would really like is to move from the mitigation standpoint, which is basically where we're just trying to keep this at a level where it doesn't overwhelm our hospital systems, um, where you know we can keep people alive if they are seriously ill, um, where we have enough medical professionals to deal with this and enough hospital beds and things like that, which we've pretty well, pretty much done so far, um, to going back to a containment strategy. And so for that, you need to be able to test people. Um, right now, there are, are very few areas that can test people with more mild, um, infections. Um, most of the tests are still done on people with, with more serious infections and also on healthcare workers who need to know if they are, um, are positive for COVID-19 and um, they would have to take time off, off work um, and not be around uh, patients. So that's where most of the tests are going right now. What we really need is more tests so we can test anyone who has symptoms and uh, isolate individuals who are positive and then find out who they have been exposed to over the last you know, five or seven days um, and put them into quarantine so that you can basically stop the spread of this virus by getting infected people out of society for a brief time until they're no longer infectious and keeping those who have been exposed from spreading the virus before they become symptomatic, um, before they even realize they're infected. So that's what like South Korea has done. Basically, that's been their model: is this test, trace, isolate. Um, but right now, we we just we don't have the ability to do that. We don't have the tests. We don't have, as I mentioned before, personal protective equipment for people who are doing the tests to keep them safe while they're taking samples. Um, we don't have the ability to turn this around rapidly. Um, you know, one of the things that we really need is to be able to take a test and get people their results really quickly, which we don't have right now. Um, and then having this kind of mass quarantine, um, again, not of the whole population, but of individuals who've been exposed also is, is logistically difficult. Um, so that needs to have a really good protocol in place. And we don't have any of that. So 
Um, so that's still what we're hoping for um, is that, you know, we no one wants to stay in in kind of a stay at home, a, lo a lockdown situation for the next you know two years or whatever until potentially we have an effective vaccine. But um, you know what you're going to be doing is is if you relax those social distancing measures, then yes, you're probably going to see another increase in cases, and then you probably have to restrict those measures again and and do, do this over and over, which um, I don't think is is good for you know for society, for mental health, for any of this. So, um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that still at some point we can ramp up that that testing and do that instead of being in just this kind of full society um, mitigation effects until hopefully we um, we do get a, a vaccine at at some point. All right, so let's see for our next questions here. Um, all right. Um, so if we do get a vaccine, um, if reinfection after a year is possible, and this is from the Quanta um, comment section, um, then even the best vaccine will have to be given every year. So that's a question from Ted. Uh, and we don't know. Uh, again, it depends on what ends up um, being the vaccine that kind of makes it to the finish line first or the one that ends up being most effective. Um, and it, it, with 100 candidates out there, it's really hard to, to say what that is gonna be right now. So most vaccines, you know, are based on, on kind of the model of immunity that um, that the host would have naturally. But there are ways to kind of tweak that. So um, so you can, in some cases, uh, conjugate additional proteins to the um, the main antigen of the virus um, and make the immune response stronger. For example, um, we do this with some of the bacterial uh, um, vaccines that makes that make them last longer. Um, and make them a little bit more robust. So there may be potential for that. Um, there may be potential to put this into kind of live vectors, um, not the live virus, it, it's not the live coronavirus, but other um, viruses that can replicate in the body and kind of introduce the body to maybe pieces and parts of that spike protein, as I mentioned before, that um, that may be more antigenic. Um, so we just don't really know. It, it may, may be something that would have to be boosted every year. Um, we don't know at this point, but it may also be that, you know, even if immunity does wane after a year or, or who knows, um, it may be that future infections are still more mild than the original one. So, um, so even if you don't have kind of complete, you know, protective antibody titers, it might be enough to keep you from getting a serious infection. And then that might be all we care about. Um, you know, you might not have to get revaccinated. So there are a ton of open questions about that right now. And honestly, there's more questions than answers. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, unfortunately, I just have to say, we just really um, don't know right now. All right, uh, let's see. Um, right, um, from YouTube Live, um, from Molly Given. Uh, how likely is it that we will discover a really powerful drug that cures COVID-19 quickly before a vaccine gets licensed for widespread use? Um, and that's a good question. I just did an article um, uh, for another outlet looking at some of the, the drugs that are being used. And uh, for most of those drugs, not all, but most um, that are being kind of examined for treatment for COVID-19, a lot of them are already in use for other um, other infections or other areas. Um, so if we could find something that is effective and it has already been licensed for something else, it's already known to be you know, relatively safe and um, has already gone through all the approvals, it's much easier to take those and kind of repurpose them for treatment for um, COVID-19 than it is to develop something completely de novo where you have to you know, determine its, its safety profile and, and everything else. So if we find one of those that are already approved for other um, infections or other conditions, then yes, I, I think that those could be um, in place before we get to a vaccine. But from, you know, the tests we've seen so far, and, and of course there are many that are ongoing, so, so who knows what the outcome of those will be too. Um, I haven't been particularly <laughs> impressed with the results that we've seen um, so far. 
Uh, we saw the, the results from some of the um, remdesivir trials the other day, and um, the ones in China really didn't go anywhere. The NIH ones that were done here in the United States seem to maybe show some progress, but that's also an IV drug, which makes it just a lot more difficult um, to get to a larger number of people, um, especially because it seems that one really might be better um, if used early. But, you know, if you have a person with a, you know, a, a, you know mild symptoms, um, are you going to give them an IV drug and how is that going to be used? So, um, so I, I think there are a lot of, a lot of issues that, that need to be worked out. And of course, a lot of other drugs are under investigation. So, um, so it, it kind of depends on, on if those are already approved and could just be um, kind of co-opted for COVID-19 or if they're completely new and, and need to go through those studies, which would take longer. All right, um, let's see. Um, some of these I've kind of already addressed. So um, one was also from the um, Kwanzaa comment section asking about um, it from Jessica Faye Harrison, do you expect that any of the current vaccines that in development could interact with SARS-CoV-2 in vivo um, to produce an increase in, in pathogenicity by an antibody-dependent enhancement type of mechanism. So I discussed that a little bit, um, but that's definitely one thing that they're um, actively looking for and trying to avoid. So they know they've seen that in previous SARS vaccines and animal models. Um, so right now we have some vaccines that are already in, um, in testing phase in humans. And so phase one trials are for, for safety. So that's the first thing that they're doing. Um, so we have one already from the NIH, which is a um, mRNA vaccine. So they actually inject the mRNA rather than the protein itself, and then the body produces the protein. Um, so that's one that is, again, already in these phase one safety trials. So I guarantee that's one of the, the things that they will be looking for in these volunteers um, is, is those types of reactions um, once they um, re-challenge with the vaccine. So. Um, I don't know. I know they're, they're, the vaccine developers are very cognizant of that. So, um, so I don't think any of the final ones would end up with that type of reaction just because they're looking for that so carefully. But, you know, once, once you have this in a large group of people, even if that's something that's a one in a million reaction, you're really not going to know um, if that happens until you have a, a large number of, of people using it. So that is something that I guarantee will be um, tracked very closely for any of these vaccines once any kind of get into um, into production potentially. Um, and then to kind of go along with that from um, OS on the live YouTube chat here, how long will it take to create a vaccine and then why does it take so long? Uh, so uh, we, we don't know how long it will take. I've, you know, the, the, the time that has been usually cited is, is 12 to 18 months. I think that's optimistic. Uh, most vaccines take more on the, the um, timeline of, of at least a decade and some many more. Um, so I work in my laboratory with a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus. And you know, some of you may have had it. It causes um, skin infections, but it can also cause really serious disease, including bacteremia, pneumonia, and death. And we don't have a vaccine for that. We have tried since oh, at least the 1950s, maybe before, um, looking for different candidates, different antigens um, that would be appropriate for a vaccine, and we don't have one yet. Now it's a bacterium and not a virus, so there are some differences, but even for some viral diseases, for HIV, we don't have a vaccine. For RSV, um, respiratory syncytial virus that causes serious infections in infants, especially um, preterm infants, we don't have a vaccine. And one of the reasons for that is also um, one of the, the tested vaccines caused antibody dependent enhancements, um, similar to what they've seen in some of the animal models for, for SARS vaccines. So, um, so, so just creating a vaccine is, is really a, a little bit of an art and, and a lot of luck um, in addition to the science. So I'm hoping, you know, I'm, 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 I'm optimistic. Um, I hope that we could have one in that 12 to 18 month timeline, but um, I'm also a realist and, and I'm not counting on it. So I'm certainly not um, you know, putting anything in to, to bet that we will have one on that timeline. And you know, of course we want to make sure these are, these are safe most importantly. 
So right now, as I mentioned, there are um, at least the one vaccine and I think one other that are in these phase one trials. So you look at safety first and then you do another trial with slightly large, larger group of people where you look at safety and you can start to look at if they actually work, you know, if, if are pr people producing an antibody response. Um, and then usually with phase three, you start to um, introduce it to a larger group of people and then you see if it actually protects them against disease. And um, so you need a large group of people to do that in. Um, and then you need to see if it actually protects them from getting you know, infected with, with SARS coronavirus too. To kind of ramp that up and make that a little bit quicker, uh, some people are suggesting human challenge studies for that third part. So that you would actually you know, vaccinate people with, with the candidate vaccine and then um, expose them purposely to SARS coronavirus 2 to see if, if it protects them or not. Um, so that's being proposed. There are a lot of issues with that, a lot of um, people who support it, a lot of people who, who don't, who, um, who are concerned about the ethics of that, especially when we don't have a treatment and when it seems to do some weird things, even in people that are um, would be good challenge subjects like those who are young and healthy and have no real risk factors. So it always is dependent on how some of these trials go. Um, if, if everything works great in the first, you know, first um, phases, 18 months, I think is, is possible. But then that remember that is till we get a functional vaccine. And that's only kind of the start of it in some ways, then you have to um, make enough doses of that to give to the population. And it may be something where you need multiple doses to have an, a really effective immune response. So each individual may need two or three doses to be completely protected. Okay, well, just the United States alone there, you're talking, you know, almost a billion doses um, if everybody would need three. So you have to have, uh, you know, factories and, and things that can manufacture that. Um, and those, those don't just spring up overnight. So, uh, so you either have to start working on that now or you have to co-opt that from facilities that are already making vaccines. And then you end up with a shortage of other critical vaccines because you've devoted that time and that area to making vaccines for coronavirus. So again, there's a lot of logistical challenges even after you have a vaccine that may be scientifically tenable then you still have to get it pr produced. You still have to get that out to the population, which is going to take, you know, if, if you say 18 months for an approved vaccine, uh, I mean, at least another probably six months or more, um, depending on, on what type of vaccine is, it is. And if we have the facilities that can do it um, to really get that ramped up and kind of out to the population um, to protect them. So Yes, long answer for, for um, maybe uh, 18 months to two years, I think, to be optimistic. All right, these other ones. Um, uh, from Brian and the Quanta comment section, um, what are the medium term prospects of a general solution to viral infection? So, so short term obviously is, is just kind of social distancing what we're doing now. Um, which again, I don't think is a tenable long-term solution. Long-term solution would be something like a vaccine. So medium term, um, I think would be, you know, if we can get something to treat it, some of those drugs that work. But one of the other interesting things that again is, is still in a gray area, still being investigated, um, but some people are looking at the potential of other live vaccines um, as a way to kind of almost I hate to say boost the immune system because that's really not scientific, but um, a, a way to provide kind of broad, general, protective, um, innate immunity, we think, against a variety of pathogens. So um, you may have, have seen some of the studies looking at, or some of the really suggestions, um, not a lot of studies so far, but the suggestions that um, the BCG vaccine, so a vaccine against tuberculosis that is not not used routinely in the United States, but is used in some other countries, that individuals who are vaccinated with that may have some resistance to being infected with um, SARS coronavirus too. Um, there's also kind of similar ideas about that with, um, with the MMR vaccine, so measles, mumps, rubella, 
um, looking mostly at the rubella part of that as, as maybe something that is maybe generating some protection there. Um, so whether those will actually pan out, I don't, I don't know, um, because there's a lot of confounding issues in there. Um, for the BCG vaccine, that's primarily used, again, not only, but uh, primarily used in developing countries who may not have um, testing for coronavirus that is really adequate. So maybe we're just missing some cases. Um, maybe there are other factors that are, that are going into this rather than just, just the BCG vaccine. For MMR, one of the reasons they're looking at that is, is again, with this aspect of, of children having you know, much more mild symptoms or being completely asymptomatic and wondering if that's because uh, that they have um, higher levels of immunity to, to MMR um, because they've been exposed to that more recently than most of us adults. Um, so those are really just kind of hypothesis generating right now, but um, people are looking into those. Um, and I think there was an article out to maybe today um, in the New York Times on, on some of that work and, and some of the rationale behind that. So if we could find that some of those work, that would be fantastic. So then we could just, um, you know, give those to to populations, and um, you know, even if they don't work specifically against coronavirus, if they could be protective, um, you know, at, at least to help the population kind of um, reduce um, reduce transmission of coronavirus or reduce the severity of symptoms. Those could potentially help in that kind of gap that we have between now and development of a specific coronavirus vaccine. Um, so. Keep your eye on those. It, it may completely fade out. It may be, may be junk. There may be nothing to, um, to back it up. But that, those are some areas where people are at least looking right now. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, all right, so somebody's, if I, if I'm skipping over your question. I'm sorry, it's, it's probably because I, I just maybe don't know enough or um, maybe it's more for a kind of clinician um, or something than myself. Um, like there's one, sorry, from, from Leonardo, do anticoagulants work to treat the respiratory symptoms? And I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great question. I don't, I don't know it, I'm sorry. Sorry, Leonardo. Um, from Dean Morrison, um, a lot of healthcare workers are dying um, from COVID, statistically speaking, could this be because of higher original exposure? Um, and maybe, so that's one of the things I talked about in, um, in the article. Um, for some other coronaviruses where they've tested them, again, mostly in animal models, um, they have seen that a higher initial dose of exposure does seem to lead to more serious um, infections. And so with healthcare workers, especially, again, if they're not being supplied with adequate PPE, um, they, they, and, and they're working with patients that are sick, you know, more of them that may be expelling higher levels of virus, they may be doing procedures where the virus becomes aerosolized, um, so it's easier to, to, um, to breathe in. Um, that's one of the hypotheses for the reasons why, why some of these healthcare workers are coming down with not only illness, but in some cases really severe illness, even though they're otherwise seem to be kind of young and healthy, um, is that exposure to a higher load of virus and especially a higher load of aerosolized virus. Um, we, they also did see this with SARS, especially in the early days before, um, again, bef before it was recognized and, and um, before uh, measures were taken to, to really use like N95 respirators and things like that to protect healthcare workers, that there did seem to be kind of a dose exposure there that um, the more virus you were exposed to, um, more severe symptoms you, you could get. And we have a little bit of evidence of that um, from the early days in China. Also, again, when, when healthcare workers were exposed to this before understanding what it was, um, that um, using, um, again, N95 respirators and face masks and, and things like that to protect healthcare workers um, did seem to decrease their mortality as in, in incidence of serious infection from that as well. So we think maybe. Um, again, you know, that's something that will be um, better resolved with good animal models and animal experiments um, where you can uh, directly challenge them with different doses of, of the virus and look at the severity of their outcomes. So, um, so that's something that I'm sure will be coming from some of these um, animal studies. Um, and on that line, um, uh, JCG856 asked, how good do we think the animal models being used are? And again, that's one I just um, a little too far out of my area. Um, I do know some of the virologists who are working on this, but 
Um, I'm not sure what their thoughts are on the animal models. And there are a lot of different ones being used too. I mean, from, um, you know, your typical kind of um, rodents to, to other things. So, um, so I don't know if we know yet. And I should mention that that's one of the issues with studying this is that um, at least in the United States, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is um, common around the world, though not completely 100% um, dealt with the same way. Um, but using live SARS coronavirus 2 in a lab in the United States, you have to have that in a BSL-3 laboratory. So, um, so there are different levels of biosafety that, um, that are required for different pathogens. So something like Ebola is a BSL-4 pathogen. Um, so this one is a BSL-3, which um, there are not really that many BSL-3 laboratories in the United States. My laboratory is a BSL-2, so I could work with um, coronavirus, you know, just RNA, but not actual infectious virus. I couldn't do, you know, any growing up of the virus in my lab or um, any animal studies anywhere on our campus because we don't have a BSL-3 laboratory. So those are kind of rare. And trying to do all of the studies that everyone wants done with this coronavirus um, is difficult and challenging because um, it's hard to work in, in those environments. You get tired, um, you're, you have to wear all of the, the gear and the um, respirators and, and things like that. So uh, it makes working with these viruses rather difficult. And so uh, while we all want some of these answers like now, like yesterday, um, it, it just is, is difficult because, because of the limited number of BSL-3 labs and also because of the limited number of people with real expertise in coronaviruses. Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, funding has waxed and waned for these. And so to have a real bona fide coronavirus researcher who has done this for years, there's only, you know, a handful of those maybe. So, um, so we, we are having a lot of people who have expertise in other viruses now moving into coronaviruses, but there's still that dearth of lab space. So it's making it really difficult to get at some of these answers maybe as, as soon as we would like. Um, right, um, from the quanta comment section um, from Rad. If, if both SARS-1 coronavirus, SARS coronavirus-1 and coronavirus-2 enter cells via ACE2 receptors, um, which I talked about in a previous quanta article, um, that you can search on the website. Why is it that only COVID-19 impacts the upper respiratory tract? Um, and so the answer for that is, again, we don't 100% know. And those are, well, that's one of the things that would be really great to be um, looked at in some of those animal models. Um, but it, it's, it, for one, it's, it's, I should say that it's a, it's a spectrum. So you can have some of the other coronavirus, one in the upper respiratory tract, um, it's, it's not like it's all or nothing, but um, SARS-2 does seem to be much more prominent in the upper respiratory tract and sars coronavirus one in the lower respiratory tract. So that's one of the reasons why we think um, SARS-2 is more transmissible person to person because of all that upper respiratory tract replication, whereas SARS original was more deadly because of that lower respiratory tract in, um, infection, but less transmissible. But the exact reasons aren't 100% clear. Um, and just because they use the same receptor doesn't mean they bind to it with the same affinity. So that seems to be one thing is that, um, oh no, I'm probably gonna mess this up. Um, uh, I wanna say SARS coronavirus 2 binds to it more strongly. Um, I would have to double check that, I'm sorry. Um, but but um, so there can be differences in, in binding affinities and also, it's not just the binding of, of the virus to the receptor, that's kind of a like step one, but there are other things that happen as well. Um, so there are different proteases and fusion proteins and things like that, that um, also lead to, um, you know, really allowing this virus to, um, to replicate inside the cell. So there can be differences in those as well that affect um, kind of locations of, of tissue tropism and, and things like that that um, for that, I don't think we know all of those answers right now and um, exactly why those are different. Um, they both also seem to, again, at least be able to bind to cells in the GI tract, but aren't necessarily a GI infection, even though they can cause some gastrointestinal symptoms. So that's also, you know, we don't 100% understand 
all of that either. So, um, so those are some of the things, again, that once I think we have some of those good established animal models and virologists to work on them and lab space to do that in, um, that we'll start to see some of the answers to some of those questions come out. Because I think they're still kind of um, unresolved, even though I think a lot of people have different ideas about what that might, might be. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so um, so from the YouTube live chat, um, so bats host a lot of coronaviruses. Is there something we can learn from the way bats' immune systems handle the virus? And that is kind of a million dollar question too. That's something that's, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have wanted to know because because bats harbor not only, you know, coronaviruses, but are hosts to um, uh, you know, viruses like Ebola and Marburg um, Nipa and Hendra, um, you know, all kinds of rabies, um, you know, a lot of different pathogens come from bats. And part of that is because, I mean, bats just are incredibly diverse. Um, we, they're, um, you know, we have so many different species of bats that it's not surprising that we get a lot of spillovers because they just harbor their own different, um, you know, viral groups. And then those eventually can, um, cause infections in humans. So why don't they seem to cause harm to bats? And what are, we, we don't really know. Um, so there's a paper out, I mean, maybe in a decade or 15 years ago um, that tried to review the literature on bat immune systems. And at that point, there was almost nothing that was out there. Um, I mean, bats are really um, hard to work with in the laboratory. They don't really survive well in captivity. Um, so it, it makes it difficult to do a lot of experimental work on them. So sometimes what we have to do is more observational data or, um, you know, things like that. So, um, so it, it's difficult to really know precisely why, why all of that is different. Um, there's also been some suggestion that um, just because of the way bats, you know, live, that they, they, they fly, they have to um, have a high metabolism so that they can um, you know, expend that energy on, on flight, that might also play a role in their immune system if basically they're, um, you know, fevered all the time, essentially, they have a high body temperature, then maybe that is just kind of keeping the viruses that they have in check, um, so that they don't, you know, sicken the, the bats themselves. But those are all really um, more hypotheses than anything, because again, they're, they're just really difficult um, to test, because we don't have a lot of of um, good experimental data on some of the bats. So um, a good question that I unfortunately um, am not able to provide a, a great answer for. Um, all right, um, from Paul Gilden, um, how um, definite of, of COVID-19 are the chills and shakes if these symptoms occur only sporadically over a few days? And yeah, I wish I could tell you, we don't know. Um, I mean, that's one of the things with all the symptoms is, is that one, we're seeing kind of an, an expanding uh, case definition of what are included as far as COVID-19 symptoms. We just saw the CDC added some um, additional ones the other day. Um, and even so, some of those are still pretty nonspecific. I mean, cold and chills. Like, it, it could be potentially COVID-19. It could be influenza that's still circulating depending on where you are. It could be um, you know, a number of other respiratory viruses. So. So we don't know, and that's one of the problems with, again, lacking really good testing, and especially some kind of a rapid test um, or a point of care diagnostic, um, like you do for flu, and you can, you know, get your results in 20 minutes. Um, so without those, yeah, we really can't say definitively because those are so nonspecific and, and you know, could be anything from, from flu to food poisoning. Um, so yeah, we just uh, don't know yet. Um, from Anki. Um, in kits, um, how long will it take to develop herd immunity? Um, and that's another good question that we don't know. So when you look at the um, percent of the population that will need to be infected by any kind of virus to develop herd immunity, that is based on how transmissible they are in a population. So with this one, again, assuming an R naught of three, okay. Um, you would have to have basically about 60%, 60 to 70% of the population immune um, in order to reach that herd immunity threshold, okay? Now remember herd immunity is not like a switch, it's not all or nothing. The, you know, the higher number of people that you have in the population that are immune, 
um, the more difficult it makes for that virus to find a susceptible host and to spread. So, you know, any immunity in the population is better than none, um, even if it's not kind of at that herd immunity threshold yet. But for this, again, because we have so many open questions about immunity, we just don't know. So, um, so if we would go over the course of say, you know, 12 months, right? And 40% of the population would have been infected with SARS coronavirus too. Um, in theory, 40% of the population then would be immune. But what if that immunity wanes after a year? So you have the people who were infected at the very beginning have maybe, you know, are maybe no longer um, functionally immune. So you're not really at 40% of the population anymore. You're at a lower level than that. So those are some of the questions that we, um, we just don't have answers to. And we won't have answers. We just can't have answers without following people over time. So it's only something that we will know after, you know, one year or three years, uh, how long that immunity lasts. And if people are really protected from reinfection or not, because we usually use, you know, antibodies as kind of a measure of that, but it's not a perfect correlation. Um, it's just one of the, usually the easiest things to, to measure and kind of the most straightforward things. So, so we don't know. And that's what concerns uh, myself and, and some other epidemiologists about um, like Sweden that is using basically herd immunity and um, protection of the kind of elderly and other vulnerable populations um, as their, their strategy. You know, the, just let this come in. Um, let's get a, a good population that has immunity to it. And that's how we'll deal with it. But we don't know if that'll work. Um, so we'll be looking at, at you know, countries who are taking that strategy. We will be looking at people who have been known to be infected. And once we have good antibody tests, we can kind of follow them um, over time to see if that immunity wanes and if so, how quickly or not. So, um, so the herd immune as immunity aspect is something that also, you know, we know in theory, but whether that will actually happen in practice, it will be completely due to like the behavior of this um, virus and how it interacts with our own uh, immune system. All right, um, let's see. Um, all right, from Rachel Graham, uh, do you believe this can be a chronic infection? Um, we also don't know that. Um, I think it's unlikely. Um, most of the, the human coronaviruses, as far as we know, do not cause a chronic infection. Um, the common cold ones or, you know, SARS or MERS, we haven't seen that at all. Um, in the animal coronaviruses, there is a feline one that can cause a chronic infection, um, but that seems to kind of be a, an outlier, and I talk about that a little bit in the article. Um, so I, I think it's unlikely, but, you know, with, with biology, with viruses, uh, until you have some um, evidence, I would not say completely rule that out. Um, anything is potential, but, um, but I, I think that is not something that is, is going to be likely um, with this virus. Oh, let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry, it's hard to answer and go on. Um, read these, these questions as well. Um, so um, <laughs> can you explain in, in simple terms why COVID-19 wasn't created in the lab? Um, maybe I can. Uh, I, I mean, first, I, I think it's, it's unlikely that that happened. Um, I know there are some really big advocates of that. But uh, I think what some people don't, don't realize is how often these spillovers from animals to people happen. Okay, so there's even a term for it um, in, in kind of the field, um, we refer to it as, as viral chatter. So these spillovers from animal populations to human populations of different types of viruses. And so we know this happens a lot and, and most of these spillovers are not documented. So it often takes something that is pretty dramatic like right now, um, like this coronavirus pandemic or like an Ebola outbreak. Um, so, you know, something where you have really clear symptoms, you have um, a population where you can see this going through 
um, the people there and something that comes to the attention of public health authorities. Um, so a lot of these spillovers are often dead ends and they're, they're either they don't um, spread from human to human. So they may go from animal to person, but then not from person to person. So they die out. Um, or they can circulate maybe undetected for a long time. This is what happened with HIV. Um, HIV actually is not a single spillover event. It didn't happen just once. It happened multiple times with related viruses. That's why they're slightly different. They came from slightly different animals, um, from you know, chimpanzees to sooty mangabees to gorillas um, that independently went from those animal reservoirs into the human population and then spread from there. But again, we didn't detect them initially because they don't cause like, you know, symptoms as um, obvious maybe as Ebola. Um, and they happened in populations that were, you know, not being carefully monitored. So, you know, in many cases it was before um, we had a lot of the, the science to be able to detect them. So, you know, that's why HIV and AIDS wasn't found until the 1980s in the United States when it hit populations that you could see, okay, something weird is, is happening here in, in these populations. But some of the earliest um, viruses crossed over into the human populations, you know, almost a century before that um, and had been spreading undetected. So um, that's a long introduction into saying that I think it's, it's just based on how everything works. It is much more likely that this is a natural spillover than um, something created in a lab. Looking at its genome sequence, it doesn't have any markers of being, um, you know, altered by humans. Um, I know, and, and after that was kind of um, pointed out, the other idea came that, well, okay, but it was in the lab and then it had just gotten loose from there, which is tougher to rule out. But um, if so, it was not a virus that ever was recorded as being in that laboratory. It was never identified or sequenced. Um, so, and, and you know, we, we, I can't say lab accidents never happen, but they're certainly much less common than just those natural spillovers from wildlife reservoirs or other animal reservoirs into humans. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's tough to prove a negative, but I think it's, it's much more likely that it was a, a natural event than some kind of a, a laboratory um, accident, right? So maybe we'll do one, the final one here. Uh, let's see. Um, last one. Is, is the idea that viruses evolved to become less, path, less pathogenic a rule of thumb? Um, and that is one thing that, that certainly people have put forward um, about this virus in particular, but viruses in, in general. And it's not. I mean, it's, it's, um, People see that uh, we have identified multiple, or you know, multiple mutations um, in coronavirus lineages, and I think people hear mutation and associate that with with meaning as far as um, changing pathogenicity, either making it worse or making it at, um, you know less serious. That's not necessarily the case. You can have mutations that just do nothing. That's most of the mutations, right? Um, and there's this idea that if something, you know, jumps from again maybe a, a, a non-human reservoir into people, um, that over time, if it co-evolves with humans, that it will become, you know, mild or asymptomatic. Um, and that can happen sometimes, but it's not something that necessarily happens. Again, we had Ebola in West Africa um, that went through many, many, many chains of transmission, um, from 2013 to 2016, before we were finally able to extinguish that outbreak. Um, and there was really no evidence over that period of time that it was becoming less pathogenic. Um, mortality rates decreased in some cases, but that seems to be more related to, um, getting good care, just getting good supportive care and not to any actual properties of the virus itself. So, um, so with, with viruses and with, with, you know, evolution like that, there's really no hard and fast rules. Um, there's always lots of um, maybe general outcomes, but even that doesn't always, you know, there are always exceptions that prove the rules, right? So, um, so I don't think we should assume that this is going to become um, less pathogenic or, or anything or evolve in some certain trajectory. We just, 
um, I think really don't know right now. And it will depend on, on um, a ton of different factors, including whether it's, it's you know, maybe recombines with other coronaviruses or whether it sticks to itself or um, if it just hits on any particular mutations that um, would make it more fit and whether those mutations would make it more or less pathogenic. Again, um, I don't think we can, can necessarily foresee that right now. All right, so with that, um, let's see here. Um, I think I will um, kind of stop this right now and, and thank you all for, for joining me, for tuning in. Um, for those of you who may have come into this midway or, or um, if you missed this on the first round, um, this will be on Quanta's YouTube channel at some point, so, um, so keep an eye for that. Um, you can also subscribe to their YouTube channel. Um, and if you're, you want to learn more about other developments in epidemiology and biology and, and math and physics and all the other things that, um, that Quanta covers, um, then please check out quantamagazine.org and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel where they have a lot of other uh, Q&As with other scientists as well, right? So thank you for joining and stay safe out there. Take care of each other. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.